Hello and welcome to today's tutorial. Um, today we're going to work on some kind of presentation, uh, but it's going to be networked. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to introduce myself and log in. And maybe here as well. And also here. So we have four different users. And um, what they all share is the same view of a complex object here. Uh, they can individually take a look at it. And then whenever they click on different parts, either left or right, it's being registered everywhere. So for all the users, let me show you, all right? So we have both the name of the user being displayed and recorded, but also the part itself is being highlighted depending on the amount of likes. So left clicks or dislikes, which is right clicks. So uh, we have this. And now additionally, what we have here is the admin view right there. So what the admin can do is they can change the scene for everybody. So now of course, locally, each of the users can do whatever they want within the scene. However, admin has the power to impose a general scene change. So we're back to, um, to the beginning here, right? So this is our goal for today. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to start with an empty project as usual. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, import the assets that I prepared for you. They're right here. But uh, just be careful. Um, I'm going to import everything besides this one script here called Network Manager. The reason for it is that it's going to generate an error for now. We're going to need this later in the tutorial, I'm going to show you how to import it. So I'm taking everything besides that script and just dropping it into my assets folder. Now, uh, let's take a look at what's here. There, there are some UI elements, there is some graphics, there is a 3D object. Um, so what we're going to do in this first scene is um, the 3D presentation of this uh, complex object here, uh, which is going to also allow the user to click on it. And so we're going to first learn how to do this and how to register all the clicks. It's kind of similar to what we've done in the previous tutorial, but then we're going to do all that over networks. So let's just start. I'm going to, as usual, change my background here into something that I'm more happy with, let's say like this, and drag and drop this asset right there. Um, perhaps what's important is that while still here in the assets folder, I'm going to take a look at the inspector and make sure that I'm generating colliders here. Uh, it's very important because otherwise we cannot register um, Raycast hits on this thing. And uh, generating colliders manually uh, is, is very, very complicated uh, for that amount of um, elements. So we have that. I'm going to adjust um, the size of this thing. 
like so. And what we can clearly see is, uh, you know, there are some random materials on it. It's just an object that I found uh, online. So, uh, you know, you cannot expect much of it. Um, now, if you take a look at its hierarchy, there's plenty of stuff here. You know, it's there's a lot of elements and trying to change materials um, manually would be uh, very painful. So what we're going to do first is a little script that is going to help us um, to manage this kind of object. So I'm going to save for now and just say um, create a C-sharp script, which is going to be called manage complex object. And let's just start. Okay, so first thing we want to do here is to make a reference to the object that we want to be dealing with. So public game object, my complex object, right? And now what we want here is we want to we want to actually unify the material of this whole object. So let's just do this first. I'm going to save this, go back here. So what we want to do is that each part has the same material. So I'm going to create a material here. Let's just call it the material. And I'm going to make it just about gray. Like so. Um, and now of course, I can start assigning it manually, but that's not what I want. What I want is that the script is doing this for me. So uh, let's go back to editing here. So of course, we also need a public reference to the material. Like so. And now in start, what we want to do is the following. We want to go through all these objects one by one and find the mesh renderer and assign the material to it, right? So let's do this. Um, I'm going to go here into the start and I'm going to create an array of mesh renderer. Um, let's just call it my parts which is going to take the complex object um, and get components in children of a type mesh renderer like that. So essentially what this says is, okay, under this name, I want an array of mesh renderers which is a component of uh, uh, of an object. This is how a mesh is displayed in Unity. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking this object and searching within its hierarchy, so through all its children, for something that is a mesh renderer. And whenever I find it, I store it here. Okay, so once I have that, what I can do is to iterate through all of them and in order to do that, we need to count for integer i is zero. So starting with zero, um, i is smaller than my part's length. So we're counting from zero to however many elements we have here, i plus plus. And uh, that's bizarre, okay. Right, so what we want to do is we want to 
take the current part, which is the container with an index. So we're recalling from this array this particular item. And what we want to do is to assign to its material our material, like so. All right, so I'm going to save this and let's see if this does the job. So as usual, I would like to have an empty uh, script holder just to, uh, yeah, of course, typos are necessary when you're dyslectic. So a script holder, um, which is going to carry all the scripts that I'm using in this tutorial just for convenience. So my complex object is the radial engine and the material that I want to assign to everything is the material. So um, I'm going to save this scene by the way as 3D scene like so. And let's see if this works. So if we didn't make mistakes upon setup, so at the start, everything should change exactly. So everything changed to um, to the material that we assign. Perfect. So we have this. And now let's go further with this. So the second thing we want to do here is a little um, interface, just like in a previous tutorial, allowing the user to rotate the object. So I'm going to do it in a turbo mode. Um, let's go. There is a button. I'm just going to make two of them anchored at um, the edges. I'm going to use this arrows, of course, as sprites. If you want to learn how to do it, you can go back to a previous tutorial, of course. I'm going to replace this. I'm going to delete the text, copy this, but this time lock it to the other side and replace its sprite. So now I have two buttons. Maybe I'm just going to say uh, right button and left button just for orientation. So now having this, I'm going to create a similar kind of rig I used in the previous tutorial, um, creating an empty. Okay. And assigning camera to it. Maybe I'm just going to zero it like that main camera to the pivot. And now what I want is the script holder to also carry the script that I provided together with all the other files for this tutorial cam motion. So I'm just dragging and dropping it here. There's my response. There is a field for my camera pivot. I'm just going to drag and drop it right there. So now the only thing that's left here is to assign actions to the two buttons. So left button is going to unclick interact with the script holder, which happens to carry the script cam motion. And it's going to turn left. Right button is going to do the same. However, it's going to call turn right function. So now that was very quick, but um, Let's hope I didn't make any mistakes here. So let's play. Okay, we can turn left and right. And that's awesome. Good. Okay, so next thing is clicking on the object, right? Um, let's try to code this. It's again going to be a repetition from last time, so I'm just going to do it quickly. If you want a little bit more of explanation, you can refer to the last tutorial. So I'm going to need two things, namely array 
called my ray, for example, and it's going to be camera dot main dot screen point to ray from input dot mouse position, right? So this transforms or essentially projects, uh, creates a ray from wherever mouse is on a screen, um, pointing towards the depth of the screen. And the second thing I need is ray cast hit, which is a special container for information resulting from uh, ray casting operation. I'm just going to call it um, info. Right, so now, is this a problem? No. So now, if we're pressing the mouse button, so if input dot um, get mouse button down, left one, then if physics dot raycast using my ray and spitting out the data to the info container. So if this operation is successful, then let's just first make sure that everything is okay. So debug dot log hit and let's just provide information about the hit. So info dot collider dot name. Right, so this should give us information about what are we clicking on in the console. Let's save this. Compile everything. And let's see. So the material changes, everything is fine, I can rotate and there we go. I'm, I'm able to detect um, which collider I'm hitting, so which object. That's perfect. So let's continue. What I want to do here is actually I want to change the color of the material of the object that I'm hitting. So in order to do that, probably a good idea would be to somehow store the mesh renderer of the object that I'm hitting. So I'm going to do that mesh renderer um, current part or maybe let's just be easier hit part. Okay, is um, info dot collider dot game object dot get component of a type mesh renderer like that. Okay. So um, so I have the mesh renderer and now what I can do is I can say Oh, let me think for a moment. Okay, so let me store the color that we currently have there. Color, uh, current color. And that's going to be hit part dot material dot color, right? And then what I want to do is assign a different color, a slightly different, to um, the material on the mesh renderer. So what I want to do is hit part dot material dot color is a new color, which is somehow based on the on what we have right now. So I'm just going to go see color dot um, red channel plus a tiny little bit, 0 0.01, let's say. Um, and then C color dot G, so green channel, C 
color dot b minus 0 0.01 hmm that's not right f is necessary all right so what we're doing here is we're storing the current color that the material has of the object that we're hitting with the mouse right and then we are assigning a new color so we're creating a new color right here out of data from what we currently have but with changed properties here right so we're adding a little bit to the red channel and we're taking a little bit away from the blue channel that should actually work already if uh, if I'm not completely wrong so save this and let's see yep we can now by clicking highlight certain parts of this complex object that's perfect okay so what we want now <clears throat> is to um, add the reverse of this so instead of making the color more red or more orange we want to uh, click with the right mouse button so I'm going to copy paste this whole thing oops not this but this copy paste here so we want to click with the right mouse button but instead of adding here we want to decrease here and reverse there okay so I'm going to save this and take a look okay let's play rotating highlighting with left button and with blue button as well okay so that's perfect <clears throat> I'm gonna stop and save good so um, perhaps before we go into the network let's just save the scene and create another one which is going to be all about this 2d drawings here so that we have it prepared for later okay so i'm going to create a new scene like that um i don't need the light here i want to have nice uniform background let's say like this um and what I want here is a is a big image. Let's just say like that. <clears throat> and what I want to do here is to assign one of these uh, sprites. By the way, let's just change this quickly to sprite. Okay. Yeah, takes a little bit. Okay, so um, image, something like this, maybe um, a little darker, so that it's better. It's easier visible. Okay, good. So, here's my drawing now. What I want from this scene is something very, very basic. <clears throat> what I want is to learn how to use a drop down uh, element, which is right here. I'm going to position it somewhere in the corner again, uh, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's just fine. Maybe a little bigger, 200 by 50 and um, and maybe
be a little offset. Okay, so now what is a drop down? Um, let me show you quickly. All right, we can just choose options. Um, so this is a it's a pre-made element. You can of course customize it or you can make your own if you're into this but um, so all this graphic like all the fonts can be changed and and so on and so forth what matters for us is to get the functionality right for now so um, let's just save this scene as 2d scene like that and now um, let's try to connect this drop down to what's going on with this image. So for that, I'm going to need a script. Um, create a script. Let's say change picture. Um, let's reload. Okay, so in order to be able to work with images, yes, I'm enjoying it very much, using um, Unity Engine dot UI. So this allows us to, first of all, reference an image that we want to work with, which is, let's say, let's just call it our canvas. So my image, and then what we want is a public sprite array. And I'm gonna call it my pics, just like that. So I'm going to save this and assign everything in the editor. Of course, as usual, I would like to have um, a script holder just so that I'm not confused where my scripts are exactly so change picture is going to sit here and I'm gonna reference my image which is this one and I'm going to make space for the three pictures that I want to use here so all the three sprites um, this one that one and that one Right, so this is like this. I'm going to save this now. I'm going to modify the drop down. So, scrolling down, you can see that I have these options here, and they happen to be three. Uh, of course, I can delete or add more options. This is all customizable. Um, so, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to give them names which somehow relate to the pictures that I want to display. So, ISO left and top right what's a little annoying is the size of this text here so maybe i can change this by going to the label and adjusting um, the size of the font and also maybe i could just instead of using this boring arial thing i'm just going to use the font that i provided here which is a little wacky uh, maybe i can scale it up to something like this so uh, that's that and then also probably I want to customize it as well down there in the hierarchy for all the items that are going to show up so this is item label um, not Arial but old school and um, also this size or maybe I don't know slightly smaller okay that's that so we uh, we are done here. Now, what we want is to create the kind of logic that connects the two. So you can see that we have the on value changed option here and it gives a number. So essentially what it does, it gives a number of um, the option that is currently uh, selected. So zero, one, two. Um, well, that means that if we just pass this information into our script, 
we're um, you know we can just very easily relate uh, what's going on here to the options that um, are selected so let's save let's go into the script and start by saying my image dot um, sprite is my picks zero so we start by assigning the first uh, picture from the list from this array um, with the index zero and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a public function change picture to and this function is going to expect an integer so a number that uh, the drop down is actually going to provide and I'm going to call this number for the purpose of this function so within this parenthesis this name is going to stand for a number that um, that is provided by whatever is calling that function right so and here I'm just going to copy this and say my image sprite is my picks well I want which one All right so I want to provide an index here and change the sprite accordingly so that's it I'm going to save and take a look how this works and if it works okay so I want to make sure that my drop down is connected to the script holder so it wants to interact with it and particularly wants to interact with the change picture change picture 2 and so here you have two options you can either do it in a static way so by you providing the number here manually which is not at all what we want we want this number to be provided by function dynamically so we're going to go here change picture 2 okay so I'm going to save this and try how this works okay the functionality is there uh, there seems to be a problem with um, the scale of our font here I would assume so I'm going to uh, go down here and customize this a little bit mm, maybe changing this to 12 or something let's see if this works I really don't want to bother too much yeah I mean it's not readable at all um, of course if you want to you can dig into this and make sure that it's beautiful and um, and works perfectly uh, for now I'm not really into that um, well maybe if I change the height here let's see yeah looking a little better uh, perhaps I can increase this All right, let's just say we're happy with this. So I'm going to save this and we're ready with the second scene here, All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the build settings and add this scene as well as the 3D scene, which we have right here. And we're slowly ready to work with networks so um, let's do that um, first I'm going to create a login scene for us so create we don't need light again we just need a nice solid background like this and a big button in the middle um, I prepared a sprite for us so I'm going to change it into a sprite um, so that we know what this button is about it's about entering the network it's about logging in 
there we go. Um, and with this, I think we're quite happy already. So we can save this as login scene. Good. I'm also going to add this to the build settings and perhaps make it the first one. Um, it doesn't really matter, but um, I just want to uh, keep in mind what's where. Okay, good. So we have this. Now, what we need is, first of all, to set up Photon, and then second, to um, do all the magic so that we're able to um, access the server, connect, uh, and so on and so forth. So let me just do this. Mm. I have the Photon Cloud here already. Um, this is something that you can learn how to do in the previous tutorial. The only thing I, I'm gonna need from here is this app ID number, which I'm going to copy and save for now. Um, and what I need to do from Unity is uh, I need to make sure that I have Photon package imported. So I'm going to go to the Asset Store and search for Photon Pun 2, which is right here. And to do, to do, do. There we go. So I want to open this in Unity. Yes. And then, of course, Unity is asking me um, what is it that I want? Um, I want to import a photon. It's going to take a while, so I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so um, the wizard. Um, of Photon Engine asks me for app ID, which I have in the clipboard. Now I'm ready to set up the project, which I did. What I'm going to additionally do here in the Photon Server settings is I'm going to open this here and I'm going to say that the app version is 001. So this ensures that every every instance or every application that has this number is able to connect to each other. And also I'm going to say that I'm going to be operating in EU region. Uh, this doesn't matter so much, I believe, but um, kind of always do it. Okay, so we don't need asset store anymore. We can close this tab. And now, and only now, is a good time to import the last part of the package that I prepare for you, which is Network Manager script. So I'm going to drag and drop it here. Mm, something's weird. Okay. So I have the Network Manager script here. Um, I'm going to place it on an empty like that. And um, we, we're gonna we're going to take a look into the script, but um, for now, what I want is to specify the name of the room we're going to be working with. So let's just call it Ika Experiment. Um, and first scene to load. That's going to be our three D scene. So I'm just going to type in here three D. SCN. Okay. And now in order to use that script, we want to connect it to the button. So I'm just going to change the name of this login button and scroll down here on click. I want to interact with the script holder, in particular with the network manager and call the function connect me. So this should sort of start the whole sequence of events from um, connecting to the master server, starting a lobby, joining the room, 
Uh, and then once this is completed, changing to um, the scene that we specified here. Let's see if that is indeed the case. I'm going to save and play. I should have debug messages in the console. So let's see how does this behave. All right, connected to joint lobby, joint ECA experiment. Perfect. Okay, so there is something to fix here. Uh, we have this weird lighting situation. Let's quickly do that. But our functionality is there. It's perfect. So I'm going to go into the 3D scene and make sure that the lighting has a new lighting settings. Let's just call it my lights, whatever. And I'm not going to touch anything. I'm just going to generate. Mm, and that should fix um, the black shadows. So I'm going to save this go to the login scene and check whether this is fixed. Okay. All right, that looks perfect. I can do everything I could do before. So we're good. Okay, so now we want to um, go into the more advanced part of this tutorial, um, which is uh, calling functions associated with network objects over the network and synchronizing it for everybody who is in the same room. So right now what we're doing is we're highlighting these objects locally. So even if uh, there are people in the same room, they will not see what we're doing. Yeah, this is only happening to this particular object here. So in order for the objects to communicate over networks, what they need to have is so-called photon view. Right? So if let me let me show you, let's say I'm on the lid, whichever object it is. Um, what I would need to add is a photon view here. Something like this. And then you can see that it has a unique photo view ID and then a whole bunch of uh, other fields here. Now, the trouble with this object is that it has so many children. So the, the hierarchy structure here is pretty extensive meaning that adding these things manually would be really painful. So I'm just not going to do this. Um, I'm going to remove this component for now and essentially add it by a script. So um, let me save everything as long as it works and uh, go to our manage complex object script. So there it is. So what I want to do here similarly to changing materials on all the parts of this object, I actually also want to add a component which is um, of a type photon view. So I'm going to specify here that I'm using photon dot pun. And here, uh, when I'm iterating through all the parts of this complex object. I'm going to say my parts, um, the index of the part, um, game object dot at component of a type photon view. All right. So it's as simple as that. So I'm going to save this and see whether this works. So let's play and let's see what happens to our object. Okay, material is changing. And then also you can see that suddenly there is a photon view here. Now view ID is zero and then all these other fields are null. So there is nothing provided. We're going to have to fix this. Uh, so on every object, 
uh, view ID is zero, that's not good because they need to have unique view ID so that they're recognizable over the network uh, without a confusion. So what we're going to do, we're going to manually assign this view ID to each of those objects. And we're actually quite lucky because we have all these indexes so we can simply um, yeah, just use this number that we're that we're generating anyhow, um, and provide it for the photon view ID. So let's take a look. Perhaps the easiest way to do it is to simply store whatever is um, the result of this operation as a photon view um, part photon view. Right, and to say in the next line that part photon view dot view ID is of a is, is essentially the number is i. Um, the only trouble is that we're starting we start counting at zero, and uh, ID number of zero is not allowed. Uh, so we're just going to add one. <laughs> okay, save. So now. Uh, what this is going to do is going to provide unique identification over the network for all the objects or sub-objects of this big thing here. I'm going to test whether this is successful. Take a look here. All right, it has uh, view ID 1, view ID 2. View ID 24, and so on and so forth, right? Well, that's good, that's fine. So now it's the time to introduce um, something quite special. So what we want to do is instead of clicking and highlighting uh, on the local object, what we want to do is we want to click locally, but we want to address the photon ID of that object that we're clicking and trigger functions for all the instances of this object over the network. So um, let me show you what I mean by that. So for a moment, I'm just going to comment this out. And I'm going to say something like this. Um, hit part dot game object dot to um, do to do get component of a type no, let's just make it easier. Info dot collider dot game object dot get component of a type photon view. All right. So what I want to say here is this photon view all right so i want to have access to the photon view of an object that i'm clicking at which is provided here and what i want to do is take a look at this this photon view dot rpc what is rpc rpc uh, called remote procedure calls means uh, that we can call a function that sits on an object with a given photon view remotely we just need to provide the name of this function and um, how do we expect it to work over the network and we can also provide additional parameters um, okay so that's 
that's great. Um, so let's just invent some functions, um, place them on our objects, and then come back to this and call those functions. So for now, in order not to generate some uh, like any mistakes, I'm just going to going to comment this out, save, and create a special script that is actually going to be sitting on each and every subcomponent of this. And this script is going to take over the task of changing materials, which is this. Um, but instead of being triggered locally, it's going to be observed by our photon view so that all the objects over the network are going to update simultaneously. So I'm going to create the script right now. Let's just call it remote change color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we need is, of course, using photon dot pun. And um, let's see, um, perhaps we can just get rid of all this. Um, because what we want is to create a function, let's say public void um, turn orange just like that and maybe first let's see if this even works so for now I'm not going to do much I'm just going to say debug.log turning orange okay so now how do we call this function or enable it to be called over the network well we need to specify in front of it that it's actually pun or rpc so whatever is below it is going to be um, available for photon um, and recognized by it so I'm going to save this and now I have again the same problem so I actually need this script to be sitting on each and every element of this object again doing this manually is extremely tedious I don't want to do this but since we know how to count we can easily assign it just like we assign material or photon view. So I'm going to go right here and say my parts game object add component of a type remote change color. As you see, Unity treats our own custom script as some obvious part of its own ecosystem. So we can assign it just like any other object to whatever we want. And that's wonderful. Let's see if this works. So I'm going to save this and um, scroll down here. And whenever I'm pressing the mouse button, now I'm ready to call this function that, if we're successful, is now sitting on every object uh, with a photon view. Okay, so this photon view RPC, the name of our function is turn orange, right? And here we need to specify. Um, target. I have to recall how to do this. Target player, mm -mm, I think. 
full time go to real time dot um target let me check for a second okay so we need to call rpc target dot and here we have different options and they all work differently that's interesting so we can specify who receives this information so well everybody who's in the room everybody but uh, the information is going to be buffered via server so if someone joins late they're going to get this information uh, even if they missed it um, and so on and so forth description of this is all available online so it's interesting to study uh, for now I'm just gonna ch uh, choose this one so what I'm doing here is I'm hitting something with the mouse I'm getting this the, the identify uh, the ID of this object so essentially uh, a reference to it in the info and then I'm getting the component which sits on it because I placed it there which is a photo and view and then I'm asking this photo and view to uh, to launch remote procedure call for all of these objects and to call this functions which sit this function that sits on them okay so I'm going to save this and see if this works so now on my left button I should have the networked version and on the right button I should have local version I'm going to save this and now of course if I want to test it the only way to do it is well I need to log in so let's try that entering here let's observe our console that's really important um, okay we're we joined the lobby we joined the okay so we can rotate turning orange okay so we're actually calling function over the network but that's great so now we can just implement all the uh, functionality that we want but uh, the basic uh, connectivity is already achieved so that's that's really uh, quite awesome so now what we want is simply uh, to move these functions from here to the remote change colors so I'm just going to copy that and try to um, try to implement it here so how does that work info collider so we don't have collider here um, well we can simply say this game object get component la 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 uh, hit part uh, material color yeah that should do I think so I'm going to save this and um, make another one right here which is going to be called turn blue and it's essentially going to be reverse okay save um, now here I want to do exactly the same down here but instead of turning orange I want to call turn blue function and uh, yeah if there are no mistakes I think this should be it I'm going to save and uh, and see if my functionality is in place all right we're uh, connecting and we can highlight things in blue and orange over the network with mouse clicking that's really great okay so everything is safe so what we want to do now is to
test this functionality. Um, so actually build a version of our um, application, maybe not a development build, um, making sure that our scenes are in. And um, well, let's just take a look at player settings, to do, do resolution presentation. I want just a windowed version of it. And um, I think I have problem with typing. Okay, so that's all fine. Um, yeah, I want to build the version of it, let's say somewhere on a desktop, uh, and run a bunch of instances and see whether they're all talking to each other. So I'm going to create a folder here, tutorial for builds, um, like that. And that's going to take a while, so I'm going to pop. Okay, so let's test this. I'm going to enter in both windows. Okay, so now they work separately, but as you can see right here, they're talking to each other, which is precisely what we want to achieve. Okay, that's perfect. So now we're ready to uh, add some more functionality to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce here at the login um, stage, a necessity to introduce ourselves. So to provide a name, I'm going to create a UI input field and make it slightly bigger like that and maybe sit in on top um, with some offset, let's say like this. Um, okay, so um, input field, it has a, well, it's, it's a very simple thing I'm going to show you just right now. Um, it just um, gives a possibility to type in something and we can um, detect these actions with uh, functions which are here. So um, I'm gonna customize this uh, a little bit. So let's see, text first of all, um, I want it to be much bigger and then also maybe with my custom font. So where it is right there and um, perhaps like this, much bigger. Uh, for the placeholder as well. Um, like that. And mm, mm, mm. yeah, that's good. Um, who are you? Yeah, okay. Like this text also like this good so i think that's there and now i need modifications to my network manager so that i can actually do something with this name uh, that the user is going to provide here so let me edit the network manager which is not open here i'm going to open it okay so here's the script that I provided. Um, I'm going to add something to it, which is going to be a string user name. And I'm going to create a public function, which is going to be called update user name. And this function is going to expect a string with the name, right? So now we want the input field to call this function and to provide a string, which we're going to then assign to our internal variable here, username is the name, all right? 
that's that. Um, so let's just quickly go back and make sure that all these things are talking to each other. So my script holder has the network manager. So what I want from the input field is to interact with it on end editing. So dragging and dropping it here, network manager, update username. Again, important, oops, important that it's dynamic, not static, right? Okay, good. So saving this. And now let's go back to to uh, our code. We can do something with this name. And in particular, somewhere here, perhaps, yeah, when we're joining the room, before we're loading the scene, we can perhaps ask photo network to uh, update the name of the player so that we have the name consistent. So photo network local player dot nickname is username. Okay. Well, that's just great. Uh, because from now on, we're going to be able to detect who's clicking where. So let's save this. And now let's go into remote change colors right there. And here's the little little trick. So these are um, remote procedure calls. So uh, type of functions, right? Now they can be left as they are. Uh, we can also provide some variables and transfer them over the network. But also each remote precision call carries its own information. And we're going to use this right here. So uh, RPC, mm, I have to, I don't remember, I have to recall it. Okay, it's called photon message info, and I'm going to call it for now info. So now, this contains a lot of information about who's calling uh, the function, at what time, and so on and so forth. So what we can do for now is simply debug.log and just put here info dot let's say just sender and then nickname. Right. So I'm going to save this. And let's see if this works at all. Because if it does, then we can list all this, um, all this data. And then perhaps you can already have an idea um, how to use it in your project. So let's see, I'm going to start here. And I'm going to say, let's say my name is um, whatever. I'm going to log in. So now I should be here in this game as whatever. Um, so that if I'm going to click, there we go, my name is going to be displayed. That's perfect. So um, I guess what we want to do now is to go into the 3D scene and maybe create some kind of text here, uh, giving us reports of what is actually going on. Because what we want this to be is some sort, of, some sort of situation where multiple users simultaneously like or dislike parts of our design, and we are able to identify them as well uh, as uh, see on the object 
um, parts which you know uh, people have different opinions about let's just say it like this so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add uh, a text and it's going to be of course customized I'm going to use my favorite font um, and I want it to be white and I want it to be locked in the corner there perhaps much bigger so 300 by um, let's say 300 um, like that and maybe uh, a little offset like this so I have the text here and now um, again we have um, since the uh, function that actually registers all the clicks and changes colors sits on each and every object here what we want is for all of them to find this text and report there whatever it is that they're registering right so what we're going to do instead of our usual procedure when we have our script holders and then we provide direct reference to uh, an object somewhere in the scene what we're going to do instead is we're going to search for this object from within the script and then um, drop some information on it so um, the way I want to do this though is that I want to give it a unique name so I'm just gonna call it let's say um, RPC um, debug text All right I'm just gonna copy this name and go back to our script which is here and now in order to work with text so instead of uh, sending um, some text to the debug uh, so to the console but rather to the text which is displayed uh, as UI element I want to be using unity engine dot UI and then uh, I want to have start function and also what I want to have is a variable to store um, reference to this text so I'm going to say text my debug text right and then I'm going to say my debug text is game object find and I'm going to search for this name um, right so we're searching for a, for an object with that name and then we want to get a component which is text so we get component of a type text like that right and um, what I want to do here is instead of throwing these lines into the console I just want to display them um, to my debug text oops is and now let's try to formulate some kind of message that would be appropriate so first let's just say the name of the person or the player who uh, clicked on this object and liked it so let's just go info dot sender dot nickname and then let's add liked something like this and then perhaps we can also add the name of the part so this dot game object dot name okay and we're going to do the same thing down here save this but um, aha, of course we have to update it so this function is not providing us 
here uh, in this context with this information. So I just want to make sure that it it does. And then uh, here I'm just going to change since it's the right click, it's turning blue. So um, whichever user hated this part. Okay, I'm going to save this and let's see how this works. Well, nothing's gonna happen here. Uh, I have to log in, obviously. So I'm saving this, log in, and let's go. Okay, so hello liked lid, hello liked whatever. Okay, so you can see that we have now implemented this reporting on, on who liked what. And as many users as you have here, it's going to give you all this data. Um, so having this functionality means that you can store this data somewhere instead of just displaying it as a text and create some kind of database if you want to and print it to a file or save it somewhere, uh, visualize it in some way, you know, like whatever you want really. So there's plenty of possibilities here. Um, actually, we could do it even better. So instead of essentially changing this text, we're going to add to it and we're going to add every time as a new line. So I'm, uh, there's a little code for that. So in parentheses, if we do this, uh, that means in text formatting that we uh, want to start a new line. I'm going to do it for both functions. Like so. Save, and let's see how that works. All right, All right. Okay, so the trouble is that um, it ends here and then it doesn't go any further. So maybe one thing that I want to do um, is just to, you know, whenever it hits here, just to reset it. So it kind of looks a little better. Uh, let me fix that right here. So that's a little complicated and uh, absolutely unnecessary. I mean, I could have done this in a more elegant way, but let's just go for it. So if um, layout utility that get preferred high, no, 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 get um, preferred height. Um, mm, I want to provide my debug text dot rect transform. Is that right? Is smaller than um, my debug text um, rect transform rect height right then I'm going to add but otherwise I'm going to simply reset everything. So just like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the same here below. 
All right, I like that. So what all this is doing is simply checking whether um, the layout of this is able to fit the actual text. And if it's still able to fit, then I'm adding. But if uh, the text is too big, the actual text, then it resets and instead of adding it just says you know that's what it is so let's see how this works i'm gonna save this and let's go here all right Okay, so as you can see, um, I'm feeling the text field here and the moment it overflows, um, I'm resetting. Okay, so the last thing that we want from this is the functionality to change scenes for everybody um but that functionality should only be enabled for one particular user so in that sense what we want to do is we want to dif differentiate um whether someone is an administrator or just a player just a user so what we can do is we can create um a special name which we're going to all the time check whether um, this is how the particular user is logged in and if this is uh, admin name then we're going to give this person special privileges let's say so let's try to implement this um, I think the best way to do this is going to be um, to simply go to our 3D scene here and um, I create an, another little script which is going to be called uh, admin manager something like this uh, usual bug here um, where is it? Okay, so um, it's going to be relatively basic. So using photon like that. And what we want to do at first, whenever we're loading this uh, this scene, is to check. Um, okay, so first, okay, we want to have a field which is going to give us the special name, right? So this is what we're going to provide um, from from the editor. And then what we're going to do here is the following. If um, photon network local local player nickname is admin name then we have some special possibilities and what are they going to be well let me just delete this we're not going to need this i would say the special privilege is going to be changing the scene right but not with our usual network um, scene management unity internal scene management but true photon so and in order to do that we're going to 
just create a little button that is only going to be visible for the administrator. So let's just save this, go back here and create this button. So game object UI button, I'm just gonna make it rather small and square and position it in a corner like so and I'm going to just change the text uh, first of all it's font and then also what it says well we're in 3d scene so I'm j I just want to go to the 2d something like this just very rudimentary um, I'm just gonna call it admin button All right so now what we want to do by code is to disable this thing unless the user is an admin right so that nobody else but this particular user can um, change scenes for everybody I'm going to save here and of course what we need from this script is to be able to do something with this button so I'm going to declare that I'm using unity engine dot UI and I'm going to say public button oh that's not good public button um, so um, so what we want to do here is if we are the admin we want to um, game object set active true right but otherwise we want this to be false okay all right so that's the first thing and then what we want here is also a function mm -hmm. let's just call it remote change scene and here we're going to expect a string mm, which scene do we want to load so here's a function and now what we want from this function is that photon network um, player no just photon network loads a level and in parentheses we need to provide the name of the level which is which one all right so you can see it's a there is a difference this is not unity internal uh, scene management it's photon load level functions completely different thing that means that it loads levels for everybody um, in the scene however and this is very important this function can only be called by so-called master and master is uh, the typically the person who created the room where all the other players are um, but this can also be adjusted this can be changed as well so uh, I'm going to make sure here that if the nickname is the admin name that we are also simultaneously a master right so I'm going to say here uh, photon network um, set master client to photon network local player 
right? So only the master client can call this function with an effect um, of working for everybody, right? So that's that's one important thing to remember. I'm gonna save this and also maybe I want to make a little statement here. So only if um, photon network is um, is master client. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, just like this. So only if we are the master client, we're running this function. Now, what we want is that the secret button that we enabled and disabled here is connected to this function, which effectively means that only administrator is going to see this button and is going to be able to press it. So I'm going to go to this button Aha, and make sure that I'm actually using this script. So admin manager is going to sit here. Admin name, I'm going to just call it the admin, for example, 808, just uh, so that it's a unique name. And admin button for the reference for enabling and disabling it right there. I'm going to save all this connections. And then what I want from the admin button in turn is to unclick interact with uh, the script holder and with admin manager function remote change scene. And here we want to provide the name of the scene we want to go to, which is going to be 2D scene. So let me take a look at the script holder, uh, sorry, at the button, 2D SCN. Of course, it's important not to uh, make typo mistakes here or whatever, uh, because it's not gonna work then. So save. Now, let's see if all these operations are successful. Let's go to the login. And first, we're going to log in as a random user, whoever. So this means that we should not see the button, which is the case, but we can still click on things. Everything works. Now, <clears throat> this time we're going to log in as a um, the admin 808, which is cool because now we can see the button and if we press it, we're going to this 2D scene, right? So of course, now I can do exactly the same in the 2D scene, which maybe is going to be a conclusion of this just for the sake of exercise. Uh, I'm going to go to the 2D scene. I have already a script holder from my assets. I'm just gonna take the admin manager, provide the data here, admin name is going to be, whoops, the admin 808, and admin button, um, again, I'm going to um, create a new one here, button, um, like so, um, I'm going to make it look a little better. Sit in here. Oops. And uh, customize the text a little bit. And we want to go to 3D. Right? So now. Um, this button wants to interact with our script holder, admin manager, remote change scene to 3D SCN, right? So 
that's that. Um, so right now we have this functionality that we can log in here as a general user and admin and go back and forth between um, different scenes. And then also we can register uh, players' clicks together with their names. And if we want much more data about them, um, let's just log in as admin just to make sure that everything works. Okay, it does. We have all the data here. We can change things here. We can go back here and everything is fine. Uh-huh, there is some problem obviously here. Um, let's try to fix this. Oh, I see. So somewhere I didn't provide the reference to the button. I assume in the last scene, let me quickly fix this. And that's going to be the end of this adventure. Canvas admin button is here. Now script holder doesn't have the reference to it, which means that it's going to try to access it and it's not going to be able to. So I'm going to provide it here. Save. And my project is done for today. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, enjoy it. Uh, have fun with it.